This is the training for the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale screen version. Why is this important? The fact is, suicide is one of the world's major public health epidemics, a leading cause of death across the world, across ages, number one cause of injury mortality in the U.S. Every 15 minutes, somebody dies by suicide in, in the United States. Leading cause of death in corrections among police, it's a crisis no matter where we're looking. The good news is it's actually a preventable, or probably our one preventable cause of death, but prevention efforts depend upon appropriate identification and screening. The Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale has had extensive use across the world. It's available in 103 languages. It's appropriate for use across the lifespan, all special populations. It's been adopted by CDC. It takes very little time. It has um, very excellent patient satisfaction and feasibility, and it's also been associated with reduced burden and cost in hospital settings and, and beyond, redirecting of resources. Who can do it? Basically anybody. You do not need to have mental health training to administer this scale. 812 nurses were trained at one hospital system and they got 99% reliability, independent of mental health training, even independent of education. What does that look like in a behavioral health care setting? peer counselors, paraprofessionals, professionals, nurses, nurses' aides, et cetera. In other settings, it's every type of gatekeeper, first responders, coaches, bus drivers. This is, represents the range of users across the world or people who are about to use it. Um, it's on the Joint Commission Best Practice list, Israeli Defense Force, police departments, fire departments, inpatients, outpatients, emergency departments, general medical and psychiatric, homeless, crisis negotiation, employee assistance programs, you name it basically, and they've started to, to come to us. And we work with many counties and states and beyond. And one of the first states in the U.S. made this very important point about the linking of systems. When you're doing the same thing, inpatient, bridge, outpatient, community, it's going to quicken care to the people who need it. Another state made a point, it's so important that the school nurse is going to be doing the same thing as the EMT, as the hospital. Now, people often assume that when you start to ask these questions across every patient or every kid in a school, you're going to increase burden. But actually, the, the data is pointing in the opposite direction, that it's actually reducing burden. This is a, one example from Cleveland Clinic that went policy a while ago. And when they relied on their question, the one question from the PHQ-9, that question resulted in 23.8% positive screens versus 6.2% with an, a few additional questions on the CSSRS, and they found cases that would have otherwise been missed. So it's a great example of the win-win nature, dramatic reduction of false positives while uniquely identifying. Another example, this is 14,000 obesity patients. When they relied on spontaneous reports, not asking the question systematically, using that PHQ-9 question, they got 452 occurrences. When they moved to asking what we think are the right questions with the SSRS, they got 12. While we're reducing burden, we're also hoping that we're helping to prevent. This is a quote from the president of American, the American Psychiatric Association saying that because of this work or this scale, we may actually be able to make a dent in the rates of suicide that have existed in our population and have remained constant over time. Now, what is it simply? Simply, it's a one to five rating for suicidal ideation of increasing severity. It can be as little as two questions for ideation. For ideation, there's always these two screen questions. Somebody gets asked, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had thoughts of killing yourself? If it's no to both of those questions, you move on to behavior. 
behavior on this scale for the first time covers the full range of behavior. It used to be that a patient or a person would be asked only about a suicide attempt. And then you miss the person that bought the gun yesterday or put the noose around their neck and changed their mind or wrote the suicide note, things we absolutely cannot afford to miss. And it's the first thing with definitions and standardized questions for each category to guide the easiest and most improved identification. Now, speaking to the full range, this is... 35,000 non-suicidal depressed adult administrations. Now, the good news is the worrisome answers, the high-risk answers, are very rare, only about 1%. But it's very important to more precisely identify those people at higher risk. So so look at those numbers. Only 13% of that 1% or 70 were actual suicide attempts, and all the rest, almost 500, were these other behaviors that we were never asking about before. And we now have data showing that each one of those behaviors is basically equally predictive to as, as a suicide attempt. One of the fundamental tenets of this scale is that you can rely on multiple sources of information. You don't have to only rely on the person in front of you or the person that is identified that you're you're trying to assess. For example, if you're monitoring somebody outpatient and their spouse calls you up and tells you that they're in the ICU in a neighboring state and this is what they wrote in the suicide note, you will have enough information to check off a suicide attempt on your form. Teachers, first responders, parents. This is a good example. Another example from a hospital or an ER. A loved one brings a family member into the ER. The patient denies suicidal thoughts, but the family member shares with you that he has been talking about suicide for the past two years, wrote a note yesterday, and that's why he's here in the ER. So here you're getting the answer on the SSRS screener from the loved one. Now, this is the core of ideation for this scale. It's that one through five of increasing severity, again, starting with a wish to die. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? No to those two screen questions. You move on to to the behavior question. However, if it's yes to this second question, have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Then you ask the next three questions, three, four, and five. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? Do you intend to carry out this plan? You can't have methods, intent, or plan and intent if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. That's why three, four, and five are subcategories of two. So this is what the screener looks like. If question two is yes, then you ask three, four, five, and six. If question two is no, you go immediately to question six, which is the behavior question. Behavior. This is the definition of suicide attempt, which is a self-injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. First of all, it says self-injurious act. It doesn't say self-injury. There does not have to be any injury or harm, just the potential for it. So if a man puts a gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger and luckily the gun failed to fire, even though he wasn't hurt, as soon as he pulled that trigger, that became a suicide attempt. And then it says, with at least some intent to die, with some being the key word. When people are feeling suicidal, they often have mixed motives. It just has to be that any part of them was doing this to end their life for us to call it a suicide attempt. So if 2% of them wanted to die and 98% wanted to make their girlfriend angry, that's what it gets called. And it used to be somebody would say, did you want to kill yourself? The answer would be no, you'd move on. Very often with that second question, the any part, did any part of you want to do this, you get a very different answer. And then it says, as a result of the act, that means the behavior and the intent must be connected. It must be the why, at least in part. Sometimes people cut because they're self-mutilating and they just want to feel better and they always have a background wish to die. Those two things do not equal a suicide attempt. It must be the, the, the why. 
And finally, we can infer intent clinically. One way we can do that is if someone denies intent to die, but they thought it could have killed them. Another way is what we call clinically impressive circumstances. That's a highly lethal act where no other intent but suicide can be inferred, like trying to shoot oneself in the head or jumping from an eighth story or taking 200 pills. No matter what they say, you can't infer anything but that. And what we're doing is trying to distinguish suicide attempts from non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. That's when they engage in the behavior purely 100% for reasons other than to end one's life. What we think of as self-mutilation, to relieve internal pain, feel something, feel better, or what we call affecting external circumstances. That's getting something else to happen. That's the homeless person who wants food and shelter or theoretically the man who goes up to the roof because he believes people will feel sorry for him if they think he's suicidal. He actually has no intention of ending his life. He just wants to get sympathy from others. Well, if that man accidentally fell to his death, that's just what we would call it, an accidental death because there was no suicidal intent associated with it. These are real cases from our hospital that we're going to go through. The first one says the patient wanted to escape from her mother's home. She researched lethal doses of ibuprofen. She took six ibuprofen pills and said she felt certain from her research that this amount was not enough to kill her. She stated she did not want to die only to escape from her mother's home. She was taken to the ER where her stomach was pumped and she was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Do you think we should call that a suicide attempt? No, we shouldn't call it a suicide attempt, and there are a few important things to note about this case. All over this girl's record, it said suicide attempt. It wasn't until somebody took the time to ask the question, why? Why did you do it? One tiny little question that we got better, more reliable information, and we think that will always be the case. The other thing is she also had suicide attempts. This was a psychotic adolescent on a day treatment unit. And she was very able to say, on these occasions, I wanted to kill myself, but here I didn't. I just wanted to get out of my abusive mother's house. And the point is, you have to assess each occurrence independently and not assume if one thing was suicidal that the next thing will be because they come together in the same patients. And it's very important to get the right number. Multiple attempters are actually more at risk than single attempters. Young woman following a fight with her boyfriend felt like she wanted to die, impulsively took a kitchen knife and made a superficial scratch to her wrist. Before she actually punctured the skin or bled, however, she changed her mind and stopped. Is that a suicide attempt? Yes, it is. As soon as that scratch was made, it became an attempt. Patient was feeling ignored. She went into the family kitchen where her mother and sister were talking. She took a knife out of the drawer and made a cut on her arm. She denied she wanted to die at all, not even a little, but just wanted them to pay attention to her. Is that a suicide attempt? No, it's not. It's getting something else to happen purely. This is non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. The patient cut her wrists after an argument with her boyfriend. This one doesn't have enough information. We know what she did. We just don't know why she did it. And self-mutilation and suicidal behavior have stressors that precipitate them. So argument with boyfriend doesn't tell you anything. You need to know why. Had a big fight with her ex-husband, took 15 to 20 amipramine, went to the hospital, drank charcoal, unable to verbalize clear intent, but state she was well aware of the dangers of TCA overdose and the potential for death. Yes, you can infer it if they thought it could have killed them. Now, there's some other suicidal behaviors that are also important to assess. They just don't reach the threshold of an attempt. And the first one is called an interrupted attempt. That's when a person starts to take steps to end their life, but someone or something stops them. So he's on the ledge, poised to jump, and the policeman grabs him back. She has a gun in her hand. Somebody grabs it out of her hand. An aborted attempt is exactly the same thing, but they change their own mind. They stop themselves. He goes up to the roof. He turns around and changes his mind. She has a gun in her hand. She puts it down. He plans to drive his car off the road at high speed. On the way, he changes his mind and returns home. And the final category is what we call preparatory acts or behavior. This is any other behavior with suicidal intent, collecting or buying pills, purchasing a gun, writing a will or suicide note. 
So this is what the screener looks like again. And you see question six is actually one, it's, it's all of those behaviors we just went through in one compilation question. Have you ever done anything, started to do anything, or prepared to do anything to end your life with many of the examples that we just went through? So you know whether they've had an attempt, interrupted, aborted, or preparatory behavior in one question. Some more case examples. The patient experienced heartbreak over the loss of a guy. She took four clonazepam, called a girlfriend, and talked or cried it out. She was dismissive of its seriousness, but indicated she wanted to die at the time she took the overdose. What would we call that? Attempt, interrupted, or aborted? Attempt. As soon as that pill was swallowed, that became the first pill was swallowed, it became an actual suicide attempt. During pill count, the study staff discovered that six tablets were missing. Upon questioning, the patient admitted she was saving them up so she could take them all together at a later time in order to kill herself. Interrupted, aborted, or preparatory? Preparatory, absolutely. This is the very example in in the question, collecting pills. The patient reported he first started thinking about killing himself when he was 12. He thought about how easy it would be to pretend to fall in front of a bus before it was able to stop so that it would look like an accident. Although he thought about it often, he said he didn't have the courage to do it. Is that preparatory ideation with a plan or ideation with a method? Yes, that's ideation with a method. This isn't a plan yet. A plan would be next Tuesday at 3 o'clock, I'm going to go into my husband's medicine cabinet when I know he's going to be away at the office so he can't come home to stop me. A plan is the what, where, when, and how worked out. Now, one of the most major contributions of this scale I think, is that it has operationalized criteria for next steps, whatever those next steps are. Triggering referrals to mental health professionals, putting on one-to-one, hospitalizing. And what that's doing is actually decreasing a lot of unnecessary intervention. Because in the past, people didn't necessarily know what to manage, so they would hear any answer and walk to an ER or intervene when they didn't necessarily need to. And this is what... one of those thresholds is. For ideation, it's if they have a four or a five, intent or plan and intent. And this is an example of how it gets operationalized. So this is an example of a hospital, JACO, uh, Joint Commission Policy. And when they have a four or five, that's when the psychiatric consultation happens. So it's been streamlining triage and care delivery and service utilization in hospital systems and, and, and beyond. This is an example of New York State's electronic medical record. There are many states where it's, it's going, becoming policy and going top down, so it's been built into this medical record. And not only is the SSRS built in, but the, the high-risk answers are built in. So if they have a four or five in the past month or a behavior in the past three months, the big red suicide alert arrows go off. And so the SSRS travels with the patient, inpatient, outpatient, bridge, and so do the alert, so does the alert history. This is Centerstone, the largest provider of behavioral health care in the United States. Same thing. When they have a four or five or question six is answered yes on the screener in that time frame, that's when the highest level of triage or alert system happens. This is my email, and I welcome any questions about how to give the scale, what to call something, how to implement it. And this is our website, which is a a, a growing resource. You can get trained on the website, um, see all the languages, Uh, again, many, many resources there.